uh, let me give you the protocol uh, that will be employed. Uh, uh, because this is a murder case, uh, usually if we give three minutes, we'll give between three and five minutes for counsel to speak without interruption. Please no more than five. Uh, then uh, the most senior justice, which is uh, Justice Lang, will have the first opportunity for questions. Uh, each of the justices will follow by, by seniority. Uh, I will go last after I complete my questioning. Uh, and each of the justices who wish may ask follow-up questions. And you have either 20 minutes or until the questions of the justices have been asked and answered. If you are uh, speaking on a uh, speakerphone, please make sure it is it is. Uh, Mute when you're not speaking. Uh, when you are speaking, better to actually pick up the receiver or the sound quality is a bit better. Uh, and if any of you have a cell phone, please turn it on silent or turn it off to the argument. Uh, and with that, I will turn now to uh, Mr. Shaw on behalf of uh, Ms. Pino. Chief Justice Gantz, and may it please the court. My name is Robert Shaw. I'm privileged to appear on behalf of Kimberly Pino. This appeal is about bad act and character evidence and the conduct of the prosecution in pursuing that evidence. Evidence that begins at the time of conception, more than three years before the incident in question, where the government repeatedly focused on Ms. Pino ingesting drugs when pregnant and asserted a relationship with the fetus, her conduct a supposed expression of intentionality toward the fetus, as if a space, an interface, existed between the two, each standing independent of the other. All of this allegedly probative of intent and motive to kill a child more than three years later. And this continued with excessive focus on the condition of the infant at birth, the infant suffering, developmental issues, and struggle. It continued with observations during a reunification period designed to promote familiarity and bonding between mother and child. During this period, the government called witnesses to emphasize security concerns, suspicion that Ms. Pino would try to steal the child, when and how the child was dressed, whether a meeting ended early, whether the child cried, and much more. And even during the time after which custody was obtained by Ms. Pino, the prosecution focused on matters such as allegedly favoring one child over another, and even how the child was potty trained. All of this evidence was so tangential, so general, that it functioned as propensity evidence, much of it years before the incident in question, all of it without legitimate, logical, explanatory connection to the issues of intent and motive to kill. And even were the court to assume the relevance of all this evidence, it was so extreme and inflammatory that unfair prejudice clearly outweighed probative value. The trial record simply demonstrates what I do not lightly assert was excessive prosecutorial conduct, none of which can be justified by our case law, none of which can be saved by the judge's standard instruction informing jurors they could use this evidence as proof of motive and intent to kill. The troubling intention of the prosecution in eliciting this evidence was laid bare in a closing argument that without restraint urged conviction based on the type of person Kimberly Pino was, her drug use when pregnant, the infant suffering, among others. And so whether under a straight application of law in light of defense counsel's vigorous and repeated objections or the court's 33E authority to remedy a judgment grounded in an unfair proceeding, we urge the court to grant the opportunity for a new and fair trial. Thank you. All right, I'll turn to Justice Lang. Yes, thank you. Good morning. Um, Mr. Shaw, I want to first be able to just uh, talk about the, the um, uh, demonstrate what kind of uh, audiovisual um, uh, components there are here that we should be looking for. Whether a video is taken or uh, audio visual, or audio visual, uh, audio, audio, or whatever, AB, um, uh, stuff regarding the, uh, the hearings with, uh, with respect to, uh, the interviews of the defendant? There was an audio, uh, there was a video, Your Honor. Uh, she was brought into, um, this deconc complex, and there was, uh, a, a video of the questioning that took place, but no audio. Uh, 
And the reason there was no audio is that the police chose, I would suggest, not to activate the audio. So there is a video, and that will be important for the court to look at if the court is um, interested in trying to determine whether she was hiding her hand, which is what they said at the trial, um, which I suggest to you, you will not see that. In fact, if you look closely, what you will see is that um, her hands were moving rather randomly, and there's no indication that she was trying to hide it. In addition to that, one of the detectives um, testified that she would um, sort of change demeanor when they walked out of the interview room. And I would again suggest, if you look at that, you will see that there's no way that you could infer that based on that video. In fact, it just, in my view, doesn't exist at all. So I think those are some of the things that, that, that you will want to look at in terms of um, visual. Well, for what purpose was this admitted? Was this admitted in evidence? The video was admitted in evidence, Your Honor. For what purpose? I, I think to get a visual of the defendant as she was being questioned. Okay. All right. Now, were her statements that at any point to the police uh, suppressed? The, she did have statements to the police that were suppressed. There was a ruling by um, Judge Kane, and um, some of it was allowed in, and some of it was suppressed. Um, the initial, Judge Kane was not the trial judge, though, right? That's correct. And so the initial exchange uh, was allowed in when she was being questioned at the police station, but she then started to crash as they testified. She was brought to a, a hospital, and so there were certain periods during which um, her statements were suppressed. And, in fact, she was not found competent to stand trial immediately, and so the trial was delayed. You may have noticed that the trial didn't occur for five years after her arrest. Okay. All right, let's turn to the um, prior bad acts uh, indications that you have uh, 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 talked about in your brief. Uh, I, I divide them up kind of into three different categories, one being the ones in the, concerning her the prenatal, prenatal stuff, prenatal conduct of the defendant, second one being uh, what happened... Um, uh, while, uh, you know, in these conditions of birth and these developmental delays while in foster care, and the third category being, you know, her relationship with him after after his birth, after after getting him back, maybe, I don't know. Uh, would you say that those are fair uh, divisions of the, uh, of the uh, evidence that you're complaining about? I would say that that's a perfect way of looking at it. Okay. Okay. Now, as to the ones having to do with the um, prenatal stuff, I think you rely in good part on the decision in Pew, don't you? I do. Now, uh, there's a distinction to be drawn in Pew, isn't there, uh, as to um, whether that was probative? Because in Pew, it wasn't the probative of intent, uh, but um, that was because she was convicted of involuntary manslaughter, which has no element of intent. That That's correct, but I believe that Pew does go directly to the relationship between a mother and a fetus and whether liability can be imposed on a mother for conduct when pregnant, and I think that would apply whether civil or criminal, um, and that is really what the case is cited for, and it's also cited for... Now exiting... Got Kafka... Huh. Was it something we said? Okay, we need to hold on until we get Justice Kafka back. Okay. Sorry. I will stop the clock. This is this happens sometimes for reasons we don't entirely understand.
Now joining... Dot Casper. Okay, problem solved. Mr. Shaw, I'll start the clock again. You may proceed. So, sorry. Mm. Um, have you finished your answer to my question, Mr. Shaw? Um, I, you know, I, I, again, I think that Pew does stand for that basic relationship between uh, a, a, a woman and, and a fetus, and that's really what it's cited for. Okay. Now, let me ask you a question. When, would it have been relevant to, uh, to anything to say to the jury, to have testimony to the jury about the fact that uh, in, uh, when, when the baby was born, the baby was born with fetal alcohol syndrome and therefore was put into foster care? Would that have been relevant evidence? No, that would not have been relevant evidence, I think, under any circumstance. And uh, it, it, it was completely irrelevant. And even, even to set the context for, uh, for, any, for things that followed, that why she didn't have yeah. any, can, even she, why the first 18 months she didn't have any contact with the child? I, 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 I think that's correct. I think there, there is absolutely no excuse for all of the focus on the child suffering when born, particularly because during that time period, Miss Pino had no contact with the infant. And it, it just was completely unnecessary. And it resembles Anastol in a way, except it is much, much worse than that case because of the excessive focus the prosecution placed on this. Oh. Well, of course, Anastol is also distinguishable because in Anastol it was uh, uh, evidence about the uh, child when in fact it was she had murdered her um, husband. That's true, Your Honor. But again, Anastol, the the in Anastol, the um, the the, the uh, abuse or complaint concerning the child was deemed to be relevant both at the trial level and by the court. And notwithstanding that fact, a lot of the focus in the case was on the fact that the the emphasis on the harm to the child was excessive. And because it is so inherently inflammatory to be bringing in evidence of harm to a child or a child's suffering, there was uh, undue prejudice that occurred in that case, and that's what it cited for. Okay. Let me ask you a question about the um, the uh, limiting instructions that were or were not given. Could you could you comment on those as to all three of the categories? Yes, Your Honor. Um, as 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 I understand it, there were very limited instructions that were provided, and I think this is corroborated by uh, the, what the Commonwealth cites in their brief. Now, there was a jury instruction that was given at volume 7, pages 74 to 75, which is really just a standard um, bad act instruction. And the significant problem with that instruction is that instruction actually <coughs> says to the jury that they can utilize the evidence as evidence of motive and intent. So it exacerbated the problem. There are then um, some instances where the judge struck certain comments that were made at trial, and that would apply, for example, to uh, this one particular witness who referred to Miss Pino as the uterus. Um, that occurred at volume six, pages 159 to 160. And, um, you know, but that again was just, you know, strike it from your memory. Yeah. I mean, you were, you were saying that there were no, uh, uh, you know, these things were admitted as other bad acts evidence, but there was no limiting instruction to the, the jury to say that that's what they were admitted for? I, I don't believe there was, Your Honor, and I looked again last night. For example, I went to um, Kathleen Williams' testimony at the beginning of her testimony. Again, I'm not seeing uh, limiting instructions, and the Commonwealth is not uh, identifying those in their brief either. All right, and how about how about uh, in terms of uh, uh, do we do we do we have instances where you can point to uh, help us out by pointing to the parts of the transcript where um, the judge uh, was weighing uh, the um, prejudicial value of this against the probative value? Do we ever have anything in terms of her articulating that? Well, Your Honor, I think that all of that is is in my my brief when I'm talking about when defense counsel is repeatedly objecting and there is discussion about this, but I would note that um, notwithstanding whatever um, balancing that the judge was trying to do um, during the trial, she really erred in that she allowed in all of this evidence. 
and defense counsel continued to object very clearly and broadly on the record, and the judge allowed this stuff in. So notwithstanding the fact that at certain points she seems to be trying to do that, she's clearly making errors of judgment that resulted in a very, very polluted record. Okay, but let me ask you a question about whether or not she, in fact, was admitting this evidence substantively or as prior bad act evidence. Do you know this? Anything she said? I think that she is emphasizing that she believed that this was, for example, not having adequate medical care when pregnant was relevant to the issue of motive. And again, this sort of highlights the issue. The Commonwealth is literally arguing before the judge that ingesting drugs when pregnant or not having proper prenatal care was relevant to motive to kill the child. And that just doesn't compute. That doesn't make sense. Well, but there are other pieces of evidence that you could argue had more than that kind of probative value, right? I mean, the evidence of her relationship with him before he was killed, right? Well, I think that as you sort of move through time closer to the time of the reunification and once there's a reunification, there's no doubt that one could say there's some minimal relevance to that. But again, I think it's important to emphasize that when you look at the evidence they're introducing, they're introducing evidence that we were concerned that she might try to steal the child. She's not putting the child down gently enough when the child is strapped in a five-point harness. Potty training. These things do not have a logical connection, an explanatory connection to killing a child. These things don't have a connection to motive and intent. They're just too tangential and they're too broad. And that's why they operated as propensity evidence. And so when you look at whatever relevance one could rationalize and then you go to the analysis of whether there was unfair prejudice, there was clearly unfair prejudice because it was very inflammatory. Okay, let me ask you a question in a slightly different way, which has to do with the closing too, which is if you put aside all of the prior Barrett Act evidence, this is a case involving a father and a mother of a child who was killed. And it seems to be that she was blaming him and he was basically, he had a deal with the prosecution and he was testifying on behalf of the Commonwealth against her, that she did it. It's a question of whom the jury was going to believe and what the evidence showed. So I guess my question is, if you put aside the prior Barrett Act evidence, was there sufficient evidence to establish beyond a reasonable doubt that she was the one who killed the child? Well, in my view, there's not a very persuasive case, but the fact is that this was a test of credibility. I'm not bringing a claim that there was insufficient evidence. I don't think that that would be appropriate. Was there overwhelming evidence? There was not overwhelming evidence. I think there certainly could not be overwhelming evidence in this case where this was a test of credibility. And part of the real problem in the closing argument is that what the prosecutor did in the closing argument is the prosecutor said her argument was entirely centered on questioning what kind of mother would kill a child and then answering that question. And the answer to that question, according to the prosecutor, was the kind of mother who would abuse alcohol when pregnant, abuse drugs when pregnant, refuse to tell doctors what drugs she had taken when the child was born, who would give birth to a drug-dependent child, lose custody of the child, cause the child suffering and all the developmental difficulties, even mentioned abusing drugs and alcohol when pregnant with a different child, and then stop services once acquiring full custody and fulfilling her obligations with the Department of Children and Families. And that's what essentially what the closing argument consisted of. Okay, I'm going to defer now to my colleagues. Justice Gaziano. 
Uh, good morning, Mr. Shaw. Um, would you say that uh, uh, that uh, continuing to use drugs while uh, pregnant would show indifference to the health of the child? I think that uh, that certainly, and this is supported by our law, one could say that there is an element of neglectfulness in that, certainly. Um, and uh, I think all of us who, who, who are parents and have gone through the process would understand that. But that doesn't translate into intent and motive to kill. Well, let, let me ask you about uh, our, our many cases involving domestic violence where we look at the overall nature of the relationship because the question is whether or not usually the husband did it and what was uh, the husband's intent. And we look to see whether or not they had a, a great relationship, which a defense attorney would appropriately uh, point out, or whether there was a history of domestic uh, violence and 209A orders, etc. Um, I understand that you say even if this, some of this was admissible, it was way over the top. But shouldn't we be looking at a domestic violence case law for analogy in this situation? And I think you you really hit it on the head there. That in this case, it is so excessive that that's really as far as the analysis needs to go. It's so excessive in this case, number one. But number two, I don't believe that the hostile relationship paradigm really applies in this case for at least three reasons. First, as I said, um, there's no legally cognizable adversarial relationship when you're talking about Miss Pino and a fetus, and that applies to some of the evidence, nor is there a relationship when the infant is born and suffering because Miss Pino wasn't part of that. Um, second, even during the reunification period and thereafter, um, the evidence focused on doesn't really comprise a hostile relationship. I mean, focusing on um, what they their concern, security concerns or speculating she might steal the baby or how she dressed the baby in a snowsuit too early or putting it down not gently enough or potty training. These things don't really comprise. And I know I know you're a trial lawyer as well, Mr. Shaw. If, and you didn't represent, of course, her, her here. But if you were the trial lawyer, and there was evidence of a, basically a who done it was it the was it the male or, or, or the mother, um, and you had evidence that she was a, a very caring, loving mother, who, you know, who, who did all these things for the child. Would you introduce that during the course of the trial to point the finger at the other party? Well, uh, I think that it would have some relevance. And again, I suppose that... Uh, and, w and would you object if the judge didn't let you put that in? Well, I mean, I think it, it, that it, it, it had some relevance to the competing issues in the trial, and it was necessary in order to balance what the jury was hearing. It would have relevance to that degree. But I don't think that in this case, the defense case was that she is just such a perfect and, and loving mother. Um, I, it, 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 it wasn't because there wasn't evidence of that. But what I'm, what I'm getting at is when you have a, um, a jury who's wondering who did it, they want to look at what the nature of the relationship of the both suspects is. It's, it's relevant. Um, I, I get your argument. Um, that even if admissible, some of this admissible, it was well over the top. And most pointedly, I think you're arguing the prenatal stuff was over the top, correct? Yes, Your Honor. But, but again, I, I think it's very important. And again, this is in a way somewhat nuanced. And, but I think it really falls on common sense. When talking about the, a, a relationship, it doesn't allow the government to go into all of these mundane issues and to introduce and pursue this evidence in a way that was meant to prejudice her. I think yeah, no, I th I, that right, and I think that goes to the, that goes to the 403 analysis, correct? It, do it does go to the 403 analysis, but again, just in terms of the, the relationship and the history of the relationship, all of us who are parents know that our, our, our relationships with our children are part of a, a larger continuum 
how far back do we go? And let, let me ask you, let me ask you, Mrs. Mrs. Shaw, because we're, we're kind of stretched for time, so I have to cut you off a little bit. Um, was there any point during the trial where, I, I know there were continuous objections, but was there any point in the trial where the judge just said, I'm doing a 403 analysis with a globally, all of this stuff coming in, and this is what I find? Or is it kind of like dribs and drabs where she's saying, okay with this, or okay, no with this, but there was no global 403 ruling? I do not believe there was ever a global 403 ruling. Um, in the beginning, um, she indicated that she was going to allow evidence in that I think was really offensive of the rules and, and, and fairness. Um, and she sort of had an attitude of, and I'll, we'll look at it um, as we go. Um, right, and that, that's, what I, that's what I took from the briefing was that once the motions eliminated came, the judge basically said, well, I'll take this one at a time. Right. But there might have well, been an absence of, let's look at the total picture before I make a ruling. Right. And, and she, with respect to some of the evidence, she made a specific ruling and said, I'm going to allow it in. And then there was some other evidence, for example, where she said, well, I think that's too um, prejudicial. That's unfairly prejudicial. And then a moment later, she goes on to say, well, I'm not saying you're completely excluded. So she was really hedging that way, and defense counsel was objecting throughout the trial, clearly. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Shaw. That's all the questions I have. Thank you. Justice Louis. Yes, uh, Mr. Shaw, uh, as I um, understand your first argument, uh, you're not saying that some of these prior bad acts wouldn't have necessarily been admissible as it relates to um, the, the, the course of conduct the um, indifference, animosity, uh, perhaps some of it to explain what's inexplicable and, con and, and contrasting the situation with Corey, and maybe maybe even I hear you, hear your point of uh, differentiating domestic violence course of conduct cases, but course of conduct. But as I understand your argument, your first argument, it's not that those issues might not have probative value on, on, on those points, but that there was never a precise explanation to the jury as to that purpose. Rather, it was as it relates to motive and, and, and intent, and that intent in this context really means propensity. Is that your argument? Your Honor, I would adjust that slightly because I, I think that you know, and again, I think one has to take these pieces of evidence one at a time in the analysis, but I don't think that there was a lot of relevance or any relevance to a portion of this evidence. Um, others, there was some slight relevance that could be gleaned, but the unfair prejudice clearly outweighed um, any sort of rationalized probative value. And I think that the reason... It, you can't go back and take these mundane aspects of, of a relationship and then infer that somehow she had hatred for this child. I, I just don't think that that computes at all. And I think it's important to also realize that Miss Pina was a very troubled uh, individual. So when you're looking at things like ingesting drugs when she was pregnant, um, the fact that somebody who has been a drug addict for decades and had been burdened with mental illness um, can't stop taking drugs when she becomes pregnant, it's not as if she became pregnant and then chose to take drugs. So I just think that the relevance there really doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. All right. So, so you would say that uh, not only do we not look to the domestic violence cases because um, the course of conduct and the nature of the relationship isn't isn't um, isn't relevant here. You'd say that uh, what was admitted, uh, despite um, how Corey contrasted with Timothy, is how um, he was treated, and how this would just be not an understandable circumstance for the jury. Uh, leaves all of these situations without um, uh, probative value of some significance? 
Well, I, I, I think much of the evidence, again, did not have a lot of probative value. If it did, it was very minuscule and clearly outweighed. I think an, a, a, a useful way to look at this is um, – would it really have appeared inexplicable if they didn't introduce all this excessive evidence? And what would the government have had to try their case? And what they would have had is um, she became distressed about becoming pregnant again, which they introduced, not wanting more children. They certainly could have inferred that and argued that. Um, her starting to increase drug use 10 days beforehand and her drug use on the day of the killing. And then they have all of the events on that day as testified to by Joe Pino and the police and the witnesses who saw Miss Pino at the hospital. Um, those were credibility issues. They needed to look at what Joe Pino testified to um, and all of this other evidence on that day and what her state of mind was. And it was an assessment of credibility. And that's what this trial really should have been. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Justice Kafker. So, uh, Mr. Shaw, uh, and I, I'll start by saying you've got a very tough job, but let me focus on this is a heinous slaughter of this child right and we've got we have to start with the facts the the number of uh, blows to this child were how many uh the number of blows i don't know the child was severely beaten severely severely beaten um and we've got to decide whether the mother or father did it right right that's the that, and, and you say that's a tough question in response to Justice Lank's ish, um, questioning that, you know, either person had opportunity. Um, uh, the child is moving back and forth between the parents. So you, you've got this heinous slaughter and you've got a lot of evidence where the mother has been indifferent to the pain of the child has done other things. So some of this comes in clearly, doesn't it? I mean, and the question is just how much, right? Well, I, I, I again, I, I think one could can, can rationalize some some relevancy. I, I think the pieces of evidence have to come in. Um, you know, what? well, we have to. The jury has to understand how somebody who's a parent could do this vicious slaughter of this child, right? Well, I don't think that that's a that's that's a counterintuitive um, inquiry. It's it's mystifying and a depiction of sort of this mother's behavior. Compared, particularly compared to the father, is, is informative, isn't it? Well, I don't, I, I don't think there was, a, a, you know, enough or a lot of focus on on the father. But I, again, well, I, but the father, there's no no indication that the father has engaged in any harmful activity besides tolerating the neglect of the mother um, or the actions of the mother, is there? I, I think that the picture is not of one just tolerating. Um, this individual um, has no money, has no job. He keeps impregnating her. He is enabling her addiction. He's driving her to get her drugs. He's feeding her alcohol. Um, he all of that her, you get when her brother all of that you on the, on the phone. He's he's interrogating the brother. Uh, who are you? Um, clearly, um, this is not just some sort of innocent person. And his testimony about what happened that evening is replete with contradiction and conflict. All of that you're allowed to get in, right? Correct. So you, the judge here is sort of erring on the side of allowing a lot of this evidence in here to solve, as Justice Gaziano says, the whodunit issue. And, 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 and I think, and, and I think that that highlights the problem that really so much of this ended up being propensity evidence. It is, look, she, you should convict her because she's the type of person that would do this. 
And I think that simply because the, there, there is a case that does not involve overwhelming evidence, that is a case about credibility of the evidence, it doesn't permit the government to then turn towards propensity. It doesn't make inadmissible evidence admissible because that is the state of the record. And that's the problem is that so much of this, it really, no matter how you look at it, it ends up being, look, look at the type of person she is. She's the person who would have done this. And that's just clear propensity evidence and character. Thank you. Thank you. That's all I have. <clears throat> this is Chief Justice Gantz. Uh, I have only a few questions. Uh, what was the age of the victim when he died? I know he was two years old, but, but how many months? Two and months a old? half, Your Honor. Two and a half, so about uh, about 30 months in that ballpark. Uh, and when was he under the care of the mother and father? I know that he was in foster care for, was it 21 months? Yes, yeah, so, so she would have become pregnant in January of 07. She gave birth in October of 07. Um, I, I believe that um, custody was reacquired, and she fulfilled all of the obligations for that in, in July of 2009, so about nine to ten months before this incident occurred. And, and w would that be a relevant fact for the jury to understand that she's not been taking care of this child since he was born? Uh, I, I think that there would be some relevance to the, and, and that the government would be permitted in order to um, uh, inform them of sort of the, the basic history. Of course, that doesn't justify what they did and all of this uh, excessive detail that didn't have relevance or had very minimal relevance. And was there, apart from uh, the evidence that was, uh, that I recall, in which he was in the car seat and he was placed on the ground, not dropped as best I can tell, but just sort of placed on the ground abruptly, was there any evidence of any prior assault or of any prior injury to the child apart from no, the your uh, honor. apart from the alcohol there, and the cocaine uh, no your honor there was not in fact there was there was competing evidence um, um, one um, person um, that was helping with the children as she was obtaining custody gave very favorable treatment, um, felt that the children were happy, she was doing a good job, she was making a lot of effort. There were others, even those who were called by the government and came in and gave this really highly unfairly prejudicial testimony. Uh, they, when cross-examined, admitted that there was no fear there, there was no flinching there, there was no evidence of physical abuse. And, and that is one of the things I think is a very important point, that had there been some sort of historical relationship that involved abuse, that would be much different. And you can look at the cases that are cited, even the cases cited by the, the Commonwealth, um, and in those cases where I think there's one case, the Gallison case, where uh, some history came in, there was a history of abuse, the parents abusing two children in that case. And very close in time, one child died, the next child um, was abused immediately thereafter and within six months of an arrest, and so it was considered relevant. But um, again, no physical abuse, no indication ever that Kimberly Pino physically abused um, these children. And during the course of the autopsy, I know there are other cases which we've seen uh, in which the autopsy reveals the healing of bones that apparently had been broken earlier. Was there any evidence of that from the autopsy in this case? You mean prior to the incident? Right. I mean, earlier, I mean, there's, I, I recall a number of cases, two of which I think I wrote, in which, at least one of which I wrote, in which there was substantial evidence that there had been earlier uh, breaking of bones that the child had, you know, the, the healing of bones which appeared to have been broken well before the events which resulted in the child's death. Is there any evidence of that in this case? 
No, Your Honor. There was none of that in this case, which, again, raises a very important issue when you just look at the state of the record, because it really doesn't make sense what Joe Pino testified to if, in fact, you know, he heard some ruckus going on, that somehow he woke up and immediately it was at the tail end of all of this. It almost seems more likely, or at least there's a competing version, that, you know, she was downstairs and on a binge of drugs and something else was happening with the children and Joe Pino. So, again, it just sort of highlights the conflicting evidence. I'm sorry. I don't understand that. I mean, most of the cases that I've seen are inexplicable in the sense of suddenly Aaron apparently loses it. But what is it about this case which makes it different from any of the other cases in which a parent who suddenly is now finding himself or herself killing her child? I don't intend to, I didn't mean to sort of challenge the notion that something can happen in an inexplicable manner, but just that I was just referencing the state of the evidence in this case where Joe Pino says that he fell asleep and then he woke up because he heard a sound and he went downstairs and the child was beaten. When, in fact, when he testifies that after they went out for a so-called liquor run and then stopped and came back, Timothy Pino, the victim in this case, went upstairs, not downstairs. He then, he also testifies that he woke up when he heard a ruckus and the child was severely beaten. So it almost doesn't make sense that he would just wake up at the tail end if this child was so severely beaten and had been harmed over a period of time. I have no further questions. Does any other justice have any questions for Mr. Shaw? And hearing none, Mr. Shaw, thank you. And we'll turn now to Ms. Sylvia on behalf of the Commonwealth. Thank you. Good morning, Your Honors, and may it please the Court, Erica Sylvia on behalf of the Commonwealth. The verdict in this case should be affirmed because the challenged evidence was properly admitted and the prosecutor's argument regarding the same evidence was permissible. The defendant's conduct from the time she was pregnant until the time of Timothy's death was undoubtedly relevant as it provided the jury with the full picture of how or why this mother would harm her child. The judge did not abuse her discretion by admitting this evidence. The relationship was dominated by the defendant's lack of interest in Timothy. In the hospital, she refused to tell the doctors what drugs he was withdrawing from to treat him, and she would rather go outside and smoke than finish his feeding. At the DCF visits, which were described as awkward and uncomfortable, she was uninterested or frustrated by him. When she finally had him back, she cut off his therapies that were in place to help him recover from the deficits that she had caused. And with him in her exclusive care and control, she continuously used and abused cocaine and alcohol like she regularly had, with complete disregard for his well-being. The defendant's lack of interest even extended beyond Timothy's death when she referred to him as the bully. Evidence of the defendant's drug use while pregnant with Timothy is not an admissible character or propensity evidence. Rather, it was explanatory and probative of her budding neglect. It was evident from the testimony regarding Timothy's condition at birth and his medical records that the defendant had ingested drugs and alcohol during the pregnancy. The jury was entitled to see Timothy's medical records, and as this court noted in Commonwealth v. Pellegrini, this defendant does not have a privacy interest in her child's medical records. The defendant's drug and alcohol use were continuous for as long as her husband knew her, and only ever decreased while she was under DCF supervision. The drug use while pregnant was merely evidence of a course of conduct. Without all of the challenged evidence, the jury would not have understood why Timothy was disabled or why he had only been living with the defendant for a few short months. They would not have understood that he was adjusting to a new living situation, why he was not communicating with words, or why he was not potty training quickly enough. The jury would not have understood how Timothy was different than Corey, why Timothy cried a lot and Corey didn't. Without this challenged evidence, the beating could have appeared as a random, inexplicable act of violence, or even an action done by another. The prosecutor's closing argument discussing this evidence was proper. It was reasonable for the prosecutor to take the view that all of the defendant's conduct was relevant, especially given the trial judge's ruling on this evidence. 
Further, it was not error for the prosecutor to make these statements where defense counsel's closing argument asked the jury to draw opposing inferences using the same evidence. The theory of defense was that since the defendant often overindulged in drugs and alcohol, even while pregnant, and because she was incapable of watching and caring for her children, they must have been in their father's care when Timothy was murdered. It was proper for the Commonwealth to argue the same evidence with opposing inferences to contest that the defendant's um, to contest the defendant's claim and to show that it was this defendant and only this defendant that had a motive to harm Timothy. The defendant was provided a fair trial. Her claim on 33E does not provide a justifiable basis for this court to reduce or vacate her conviction. Um, thank you. All right, I'll turn to Justice Link. Well, uh, good morning, Counselor. Um, let me ask you about the um, uh, evidence having to do with the prenatal uh, conduct. Assume she had been a loving and attentive mother after she received um, the child back from DCF because the child was born with a uh, fetal alcohol disorder. Suppose um, uh, suppose it was not that. Suppose it was something else having to do with lungs because the mother uh, smoked cigarettes during pregnancy. You know, it was otherwise a loving mother. Um, tell me the relevance then of the smoking history to whether or not the child was uh, later killed by the mother. Um, so in your um, hypothetical, I just want to make sure I understand. Um, in your hypothetical, the mother smoked and the child was born with lung deficiency, but the mother was otherwise loving? That's right. Is it relevant? Um, it, it depends if on... The child that's two and a half years old is then murdered by someone, mother or father, we're not sure who. Is that relevant then? Is that relevant if the mother neglected the child by smoking? Did she, did she continue to smoke because she'd smoked before? Not not picking out to smoking just, just during her pregnancy, but always having smoked, continues to smoke during pregnancy. Maybe she continues to smoke even after the child has lung, lung, lung problems. I don't know. Smoking is one of those addictions, too, that you can just uh, just see that women continue to do during pregnancy. What, is it, what does it show about the woman that would be relevant to whether or not she murders the child? I don't understand that. Well, in that situation, it's much more attenuated, and, and cigarettes are a legal, a legal vice here. Um, alcohol is legal. Okay. Absolutely. Um, and it was fetal alcohol syndrome. It wasn't, it wasn't so much drugs, was it, that the child was born addicted to? It was drug withdrawal as well as fetal alcohol. Okay. But it's one of them is legal. Right. Um, but in the hypothetical you gave, um, I would say that the relevance there is much more attenuated and tangential. Um, but in this case, just the, the prevalence of the, the alcohol and cocaine use, the knowledge that she was pregnant, the knowledge... Um, well, I mean, I was, my, my smoking mother knew she was pregnant, too. And just to, I'm having trouble understanding what, what it is that a woman can do and can't do when she's pregnant that isn't going to come back to haunt her later. Well, in the in the situation you gave where the the um the, the mother has a good relationship with the child, I would say that the the smoking during pregnancy is much less relevant because it doesn't show a course of conduct, a course of conduct that begins um, as an abusive or neglectful pregnancy that in this case transformed into more. I agree. Um, looking at the cases, especially Commonwealth versus Kakanagar, which is cited in my brief, I would agree that that um, the drug use while pregnant isn't in and of itself um, evidence of intent to kill. It's um, evidence of this beginning relationship of neglect and abuse, this relationship that's starting in this abusive place, and I think it's relevant to see how the relationship transforms from there after and the baby's born. Do you really don't see this as having been a, an argument ultimately that, that because she was the kind of woman who was a terrible mother that she would have murdered her child? I don't think that's necessarily what the prosecutor was arguing in her closing. I think she was asking the jury to, to look at what type of mother she was to Timothy. What I understand that. What type, of mother, what type of mother she was to Timothy. That's exactly it. Uh, but what does that have to do with whether or not she was the one who killed him? I'm not understanding the relationship there. You know, because other than other than the fact that you know she's just the kind of woman who did this. She's a terrible mother. She wasn't going to win Mother of the Year award, that's for sure. But a terrible mother. Why does that mean that she would kill her child? I don't understand the connection. Well, when we have a who done it, and it's either um, mom or dad, I think definitely the nature of the relationship between mom and child is relevant when um, we are trying to prove that mom was, um, in fact, the person that killed him. 
So I think showing her course of conduct over time and how it started as this neglectful pregnancy and turned into this. Um, in course of conduct as opposed to motive or intent? I think the course of conduct goes towards her developing of her motive and intent uh-huh. over time. Okay. I think it started as one thing, and after um, she gave birth to Timothy, she, she could have chose to be more involved at the hospital. She could have told the doctors what um, drugs she had taken to help it with um, facilitating his treatment, um, but she wouldn't tell the doctors what she had taken. So they had to run tests on him to figure it out to provide the adequate. I got it. I got it. I got it. I got it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but here's the thing. I, what I'm kind of trying to get at is I don't understand why this is not there for propensity purposes. I don't. I'm not seeing that this is a. Is it? It doesn't. Uh, all right. Well, let me ask it this way. What, what limiting instructions did the judge give? This is all prior bad act evidence. It wasn't substantive evidence, right? It was just. It was just. It right. was just there for prior bad acts, just to show prior bad acts, right? Right. So the judge gave um, a limiting instruction. Just one? Final charge. Just once? Just one limiting instruction? Yeah. Not as the evidence no. came in. She didn't have instruct the jury that they couldn't, uh, uh, they couldn't uh, uh, entertain this evidence for any reason other than the fact that there was, uh, there was, a, it was relevant only to uh, establish motive or intent or course of conduct. They couldn't be. She wasn't limiting it anyway, except in the final instructions you're saying? Um, that's my reading of the record, yes, Your Honor. Okay. So was it argued as, uh, when closing argument was argued as substantive evidence or was it argued as prior bad act evidence? I was argued as prior bad act. Uh-huh. Okay. All right, thanks. I don't have anything else. Thank you. Justice Garcia. Yeah. Don't, don't, we, don't we draw those lines when we're looking at bad act evidence? So, for instance, uh, whether or not someone's a terrible mother doesn't make that person a murderer. Um, in the domestic violence context, we have a whole bunch of terrible husbands, um, but if it raises to a certain level, they become it becomes probative as to who done it. Is that true? Yes. Um, so, for instance, if we had evidence that someone was a jerk of a husband and um, was neglectful, that may not be admissible, but if we have evidence that the husband was an abuser, that might be admissible. Sure. But here, um, one of the problems you've got is just the overwhelming nature of the bad act evidence that came in, correct? I would say uh, it's not too overwhelming in this case. It was limited um, by the judge in the motion hearing prior to trial. Well, when the bad act evidence just subsumes the case, like Mr. Shaw was arguing, don't you have a problem? Well, I wouldn't um, characterize it as subsuming the case, given the other evidence um, that came in as well, the other um, inculpating evidence against the defendant. I would think that even without this, you know, pregnant drug use evidence, um, that there would still be sufficient evidence to convict in this case. And let me ask you about the way the judge uh, kind of handled the uh, bad act evidence. I remember reading that she had said something like, I'll take this one at a time and we'll go slowly. But at some point, doesn't the judge have an obligation to look at the totality of the evidence that's coming in and do a 403 balancing rather than this kind of cut by just like a thousand cuts that the defense would argue? Right. I'm not sure. So, did, she, did she ever globally say, let's, let's step back and look to see what the impact of all this evidence is? Well, she didn't call it a 403 analysis, but she gave um, a sort of general ruling. Um, I would ask you to look at volume 3, page 52, um, where the judge says, quote, I think that the conduct of the defendant while she was pregnant with Timothy and during the course of his very young life is relevant and probative to the identity of the person or person and relevant to motive. There's lots and lots of cases that talk about the relationship between the child and the defendant to be highly relevant. So in that sense, okay. she kind of is giving okay, but, a general... But, but, that, but that's one half of the 403 analysis. Lots right. of evidence is relevant. The, the second half is the prejudice prong, and that wasn't done, or was it? I don't believe so. All right, thank you. I have no further questions. Justice Louie. Yes, um, thank you. Um, could you please uh, explain to me uh, what you think uh, the relevance of the prior bad acts was as it relates to uh, motive? 
Um, are you talking about them all collectively or, or a one certain part of that act? Ethan, give me one. Um, well, I know that um, Attorney Shaw argued that the pregnant drug use is the most damning um, and prejudicial part. Um, and I would argue that in collection with the other prior bed act is relevant of this course of conduct and this development yeah, no. relationship. And, and so would I. And so would I. Shows course of conduct to some extent. Uh, weigh probative value and undue prejudice. Shows an explanation. Uh, might show indifference, perhaps hostility, but that's not my question. Uh, my question is, what's its relevance as it relates to uh, motive? Because you just gave us the limiting instruction and the analysis that the judge gave, and it was motive and identity. Right. Um, so I think it just shows her her behavior towards him shows how her um, intent to harm him or her indifference towards him develops over time. And it shows the difference between her relationship with Timothy and Ms. Pino's relationship with Timothy. And when the jury looks at that, they can see how she's the only one that has this sort of animus towards the child, or at least, you know, given the evidence, she has this visible animus towards the child. He, um, she had always been guarded with him. She, you know, turned him away at visits. She returned him early. Um, she was frustrated by him. He, unlike Corey, was different and to her represented her failure. She, he was the embodiment of things she had done wrong. What was her motive? What was, what was her motive? Well, I would be speculating at this to what the jury found, but um, I believe that the evidence showed that... In the light most favorable of the Commonwealth, what was her motive? Well, she wanted to go on living her her lifestyle, and Timothy, you know, kind of hindered that. He was too needy. He was too, um, you know, he wasn't as good of a baby as Corey, and she said she said that. He cried a lot. Corey didn't. Um, you know, Timothy had these difficulties where he wasn't always communicating with words. Um, he still had some physical disabilities, and she knew that, and she was frustrated by him, for instance, with the potty training, um, that he wasn't learning it quickly enough. She was seen, you know, forcibly putting him on and taking him off the, the, the potty chair and putting him in the corner. Um, and Mr. Pino even testified that he did see the defendant thank Timothy on a few occasions. Um, I would point to volume three, pages 128 to 129. He did see the defendant, um, you know, raise a hand to him in the past. Um, and there was never any evidence that Joe Pino had any inkling of, you know, indifference towards the child. In fact, it was the opposite. There was evidence at the DCF um, visitations that Joe was trying these new techniques. He wanted to learn. He wanted to bond um, with Timothy. He would always, you know, grab the child and try to, you know, cheer him up. And that. And how about you know, on what? What was the? Um what was the relevance of the prior bad access to identity? Um, well, again, I think in this who done it situation, I think the, the prior bad acts show that it was this defendant, as opposed to the only other, you know, person in the house that could have done it. It shows that this defendant had, you know, the ability and the motive um, and the wherewithal to do it, and and her husband, in fact, did not. She well, that, even motive and statement. opportunity. Identity usually is prior bad acts that are very similar and unusual. I guess, right, my, I guess, I guess my point is that I have uh, no doubt that some of these, some of this evidence um, was relevant and and that it's uh, the probative value of some of it didn't um, outweigh its probative value, the undue prejudice. But the, the question is, was the, the you say there was one limiting instruction, and whether okay. that focused the um, the jury uh, on what they could use the evidence for. And of course, if you don't have the limiting instruction before the closing argument, the jury really doesn't know what to do with what kind of mother was she. Sure, I think that's possible. Yeah, and um, and then I guess the other uh, point is, is there a, a, a point in time, I, I know that you say that it wasn't reached here, but is there a point in time where it just overwhelms the rest of the case like Commonwealth versus Dwyer? 
and and you you think that it wasn't that significant a percentage of the case, the prior bad acts. Right. Yeah, that would be the Commonwealth's position that it didn't overwhelm the rest of the case. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Justice Kafker. I you know I, I'm I'm struggling with. Is there some kind of organizing principle? It's, I mean, I understand the judge excluded evidence that she prostituted her other child, right? She excludes that. Is that correct? Yes. She does that, but does she have any kind of limiting or organizing principle for the evidence she lets in with this child? I mean, I, I can see, for example... Was she, was that evening, was she trying to get drugs that evening? I can't remember. Um, she did make a purchase of cocaine earlier that day. And, and so, she, so I can see even the prenatal that, you know, when it comes to drugs, everyone else's pain doesn't matter. She'll do anything she wants, even though she knows it's going to lead to the child's you know, being born addicted to cocaine. I, I see that as some kind of organizing principle, but I don't see, you know, some of this other stuff. It just, it's just, it seems like there's sort of a, as Justice Lank puts it, terrible mother syndrome. Um, but there's, is there any way I can look at all this evidence and see there's an organizing principle um, directed to that evening's killing? Or is it just sort of indiscriminate evidence of how terrible she is to this child? I just think the overwhelming principle would be just the nature of the relationship between the defendant and the child. Um, none of the evidence that the Commonwealth offered or that came in had to do with her relationship towards any of her other children. Um, it's not, you know, like the Anastal case in, in that sense. Um, all of the evidence here had to do directly, you know, with the, the two of them together um, and how that relationship developed over time. Their relationship was quite unique in that um, they only lived together for the last, I believe, eight months of his life. So there wasn't, you know, a lot of this, this contact in the first 21 months. It was only characterized by these DCF visits that were, you know, either weekly or biweekly. Um, so there wasn't you know, the relationship wasn't as common. I mean, but, okay, so this stuff is prejudicial, right? There's no doubt about it. Um, the question is, is its relevance outweighing its prejudicial? So, but again, everything comes in related to this child, essentially. There's nothing, does the judge exclude stuff throughout the course of the trial, or she just always lets it in? She doesn't, doesn't say enough, um, enough. She doesn't say enough, enough at certain points. She excludes some things and she strikes other things throughout the course of the trial. Yes. Okay. And I guess then I get to, so she's convicted of extreme atrocity and cruelty, right? Yes. Does that, does that save you in certain respects because the crime is so atrocious, the beating is so atrocious? And we, even if we conclude that there's too much prejudicial information here. Can we find it harmless? Tell us how we can do that, please. At least on the extreme atrocity and cruelty as opposed to the premeditated murder point. Right. I think you can find it harmless given the extent of the other evidence um, against this defendant. Um, okay. So why you, you yeah. better give us a better give us a good shot at that. Why don't you tell us why, even if a lot of this terrible mother stuff was introduced, it didn't prejudice the verdict here. Right. Go ahead. Um, why, why is it so overwhelming that it's her, not her husband? Right. Well, first, defense counsel at trial conceded that all of her behavior and actions towards the trial after unification were relevant um, in this court. He didn't, you know, combat those at the trial. Um, so that would encompass um, her, her daily or weekly drug use while she exclusively cared for him um, and the fact that she cut off his therapies and he did regress because of those. And then in terms of the other evidence, we have, um, we have Joe Pino's testimony, which I know is a credibility call for the jury, um, but it was there to me, make. Can you tell me about her hand? What do we know about her hand? Um, how, how swollen is her hand? Um, what is the evidence on that? 
Sure. So we have the testimony from, um, I believe, several officers who were there um, at the police station for questioning, and they each testified similarly that she had this red, swollen um, right hand that was almost, you know, double the size of her left, and that she kept, you know, moving her hands around or under the table or trying to, you know, somehow block the, the view of her right hand. Um, that was and the testimony. The expert, does the expert testimony describe the child being punched in the head or because the child's blood is on the walls and other things, right? Right. So the um, the medical examiner's testimony wasn't clear in terms of what instrument, if any, was used, um, but he described upwards of five um, blunt force traumas, you know, in, in and about the, or on and about the head and face. Yeah, but, but how, do, how do we connect the swollen fist to the cause of death? It's you know, it could have been the the weapon. You know, it could have been what was used to administer those blows. Um, this was a two year old child. Is there any testimony making that connection for us? Not, not you know, explicitly that she beat him with her fist. Um, okay. That it was an right. inference no, that could have been drawn. I have no further questions. Thank you. Ms. Chief Justice Gantz, following up on that, I, I thought there was evidence that there was damage to the to the uh, wooden walls, which I guess were plywood, in the room. Yes, it was. Um, it was like a wood paneling um, that would just, you know, make the, make up the walls of the, the basement. Yeah. And was, there, was, there, and, the and was, and was any blood found on those walls? Um, I believe there was some blood. Um, it was blood was pretty much all over that basement room. Okay, and I'm trying to think. Do we know where th did the blood come from? Wounds to the Skull? Did it come from the from the nose bleeding? I guess there was nose bleeding. Where, where, where did it there come was, from, according to the autopsy? Yes, there was significant nose bleeding, and it wasn't clear from my reading of the record if there were any open lacerations um, on his head or face, but there was significant nose bleeding and significant bruising and skull fracture. <laughs> okay. Uh, you speak about... <laughs> The mother's indifference, and I understand that. Uh, and then, but then you also speak of intent to harm, but they're different. Uh, was there any evidence of, I mean, is this the first, I mean, put aside the, the drug addiction. <coughs> is, is this the only incident you have of an affirmative intent to harm? Is there any evidence of corporal punishment or anything else which would reflect an intent to harm until the day of the killing? Um, I believe that Joe Pino does testify that he had observed um, instances where she had um, spanked or otherwise hit the child um, over the course of the time that he had been returned to their custody. Okay, and did, was there anything about that that he thought to be extraordinary or excessive? I don't believe he testified to what he what he thought about that. Now he pleaded thing. guilty to reckless endangerment, correct? Yes. What? Uh, of course, that would not that would have been done separately. What was the Commonwealth's proffer as to what he did to recklessly endanger the child? I'm not sure specifically, but um, I believe it was just his, um, you know, tolerance of this behavior going on by the defendant and him doing nothing, you know, to assist. To to tolerance of what behavior? I mean, that's that's what I'm trying to sort out. I mean, as far as I can tell, we have a, one incident uh, of truly of truly violent behavior, and I'm trying to understand, based on the Commonwealth's view of the case, as to how he could have recklessly endangered the child by his conduct. Well, there was also a lot of drug use happening in front of the children. Um, there was he, I believe, testified to that that she would, you know, take the drugs downstairs, and the kids would be downstairs, you know, trying to go to sleep, and she would, you know, take the drugs in their, in their presence, okay. and she would take them to to buy cocaine. They would all be in the, you know, family car together, and they would accompany her to these buys. Now, I believe she, at the least, there was evidence, I guess, from the husband that she had said that that he bit me. The child bit bitter. Yes. Is it was there any was there any evidence, was there any observation of her that would be consistent with that? Or inconsistent with that? 
Um, to my knowledge, I, I don't believe there was anything that, you know, could have been consistent with that. I don't know um, to what extent she was injured besides that swollen red hand. Um, and it was unclear from her statement or Joe's recollection of the statement where the child, in fact, did bite her. Um, but it's the, it would be the Commonwealth's um, position that that is not or could not ever be, con, you know, could not ever be viewed as reasonable provocation. Right. I understand that. Uh I guess the husband, the first thing he says is that she lost it when he takes her to the, to the police, correct? Something to that effect, yes. Uh, is that the Commonwealth's view of the case? That basically something happened that night in which she lost it? It's the Commonwealth's view of the case that it was building and something triggered her. To lose it. It was this, you know, constant indifference towards him and that, you know, when she did lose it, he would have been and was the target of this lashing out. Right. Now, all of these cases of child deaths are awful, and this one is also awful. Uh, but uh, in my experience, most don't result in the first degree. Uh well, I think of Al- Alamani, which is a case I tried, where the Commonwealth alleged only manslaughter. In Woodward, I believe, they saw it second degree. Uh, and, of course, the judge dropped it to involuntary manslaughter, and the SJC affirmed. Uh, are there any cases in which, in which this has been resulted in a first-degree murder as opposed to a second-degree or a uh, involuntary manslaughter? A, a child death, you mean? Yeah, an infant's death or a toddler's death, this kind of... Um, I'm not sure off the top of my head if there are any, you know, specific first-degree murder cases that deal um, with children, but I do think, and it's a Commonwealth position, that the evidence here more than supported um, the, the verdict of extreme atrocity and cr- or cruelty in this case. But, but don't they almost always, in these cases, I mean, the, the typical testimony is that the... And I think it was probably in this case too. I mean, the testimony I recall from a number of other cases is the is the the the, the impact on the child was equivalent to the child to the either a motor vehicle crash or the child being dropped from a three story building. Was there testimony of that sort here? I don't think I understand your question. I'm sorry, Your Honor. In in, in the cases that I remember, okay, the. Uh, there was there's, there's expert testimony, perhaps from the treating physician at the hospital, who says the impact on the child here was equivalent to the child being dropped from a second or third floor uh, window, or the equivalent of a serious automobile crash, just to, as, as a reflection of the severity okay. of the impact. Was there comparable evidence in this case? There was testimony, I believe, from the uh, medical examiner where he um, described a lot of the injuries suffered around the child's ears um, and the sides of his head as being consistent with boxing injuries he's only ever seen in boxers. Um, so that would kind of be the, the most comparable type of evidence or testimony here. And, and I guess the question I have is since the, the, that kind of evidence is, I think, the norm in in these cases, what, what what would make this case, and this goes to our 33-year responsibility, what makes this case a first degree as opposed to comparable other also horrible crimes uh, in which somebody lost it and which somebody bashed the child or shook the child or banged the child against a wall, uh, which resulted in either a involuntary manslaughter or second degree? I think the evidence um, supports, you know, some kind of intent um, on the defendant's behalf, either to harm or to to do the act um, that would have, you know, resulted in the death. Um, I think that that evidence is, you know, the the whole entire nature of the relationship. Again, it's that evidence that shows her neglect, butting into and becoming, um, you know, this indifference, this, you know willingness to raise a hand to the child and um, on top of that there's other evidence that shows you know that she knew and understood the severity of her actions I think Joe Pino had testified that she was standing on the stairs and you know she said she knew she was going to do 
a lot of time for this. Um, she recognized what she had done, you know, and, and what um, what she did. And she kind of had this consciousness of guilt afterwards where she said, you know, the answer to every question is I don't know. And, you know, she didn't remember and that um, she didn't want to remember. And she referred to the child not by his name but as the boy. She was distancing herself. Um, so I think everything from start to finish in this case is relevant and shows that over time she was she was building this intent um, towards him, this negative indifference and animus towards him um, that was different than her relationship with Corey. Um, and lastly, I would just say, you know, in this type of whodunit situation where all of the evidence and, you know, even though that known to the officers investigating the case at the time led them to investigate the defendant and not Joe Pino. It was even her own statement that, you know, pushed that investigation towards her. She cleared Joe of any, you know, wrongdoing when she said he was asleep the whole time. He wasn't even with the child when this took place. So again, that was another, you know, reason and it's another piece of evidence that goes towards this conviction that's not the prior bad act evidence, um, where it shows that she, you know, inculpates herself in this situation. Okay. Uh, that concludes my question. Before I, before I, I, I pass the floor on to my colleagues, I, inv- I invite, uh, both defense counsel and, uh, and the Commonwealth to furnish us with, with the 16L letters indicating whether we have comparable cases where uh, these kinds of uh, death to a child by a parent have resulted in a first degree as opposed to a second degree or or involuntary manslaughter result. So I'd be interested to see whether this is within the uh, within the way these cases are generally handled or whether this is uh, this is well outside the norm. So I, I invite the parties to submit a 16 mil letters on that point. Uh, are there any further questions from uh, the uh, the justices? Yeah, I have one. The boxing injury testimony, um, does that support, was, was that connected to, you know, the, the fist in any way? I think it's an inference that fist. could have been drawn by the jury. Mm-hmm. And Okay, thank you. Okay, that concludes our argument. It is uh, 1020, and we will commence our ensemble on a separate line at 1025. Thank you to, uh, to all counsel. Thank this you. concludes the argument.